Rett syndrome is a genetic disorder. 99.9% um, .9 of the time it's not hereditary, but it is genetic. So it's a random mutation that happens in the DNA at birth on the X chromosome in a gene called MECP2. It's a Goldilocks paradox. Um, too little of MECP2 is not a good thing. Too much of MECP2 is not a good thing. It's got to be right in the middle. Rett syndrome is also not a degenerative disorder. Girls with Rett syndrome will live well into adulthood. I've been coming here to the Natural History Study with Camilla for, this is my fourth time, so I've been coming here for two years. I feel really good about Camilla being involved in this study because we are contributing to the knowledge of Rett syndrome. We're contributing to helping the research doctors out there understand Rett syndrome. The Natural History Study right now is at a critical point in time. It needs to be continued. Um, Ten years isn't enough time. There's multiple settings which we do the natural history study. However, we knew that there were a lot of people who were unable to be able to come see us. So we started doing traveling clinics, and we go to those sites every six months, and we cram that into the weekend, which allows the families to come in to see us uh, at a place that's closer to them. In a typical day, the child and the family comes in, uh, we go through a, a prescribed set of forms that we have to get filled out each time. She's weighed, they do a little pinch test of her fat and ask me some questions about her nutrition and we spend quite a bit of time talking back and forth about her progress and any concerns I may have. When I come here and I'm able to talk about the gains that Camille has made, it's like a celebration. She's using her iPad to communicate now quite well. She's able to point with her finger. In the regular community, who cares if she can point? Everyone can point. But when I come here, it's a miracle that she can point, and other parents and the doctors want to know, how did you teach her to point? It's a moment of pride because they don't ever get a chance to walk into a room filled with other children with Rett syndrome and MECP2 disorders. They're coming to see their friends, and they're coming to see people who care about Rett's, and they're coming to share their, their experiences, and that will lead, I think, to improvements in daily life. I can say this with some facts, that uh, no other uh, disorder has the degree of retention that we have. For me, it's really important that we get to see Dr. Percy every six months, and that we get to know him as a person, and he gets to know not only Camilla, but us as a family. Consistency is extremely important when we are collecting data for the natural history study. When we do our measurements, we have trained amongst ourselves so that we do the same measurements the same way, so that we are all getting consistent answers. If it's garbage in, it's garbage out, and we want good quality data. Because that's the kind of information that the drug companies, that the FDA, that regulatory agencies want to know because that's what's going to help guide drug treatment trials is the understanding that you gain from a natural history study. About a year ago, I was sitting in my office and I got a call uh, from a uh, drug company which is actually based in New Zealand. Uh, telling me that they have a drug that they would like to try out and they're calling me because I have some knowledge of Red Syndrome. So without this natural history study, without these traveling clinics, that drug company wouldn't approach me and wouldn't have thought about, oh, our novel new drug that we're developing might do something very good for Red Syndrome. The challenge in front of us is the natural history study is setting us up outcomes that we need to actually understand. And at the same time, the basic science is coming along and saying, all this biochemistry is coming together. We now have some pathways to start some treatments. And so the two are meeting. They're about to cross. We have two clinical trials that are underway today. And I am hopeful that we'll have more of those coming down the road. I'm hoping that as they gather information from my daughter, Camilla, and see her progress, that it might give another parent hope. Bringing people together who understand a rare disease is helping people today, not just future research. If we waited for a cure for diabetes, we would still be waiting. We don't have a cure for diabetes, but yet we know how to treat diabetes with insulin, and that's what we need to do, something very similar for our girls. And I think that those technologies are out there.